we make about 45 million pounds of chips in a quarter. That equates to about 200 million pounds of potatoes, which is quite a few. What's interesting with M&T is, is they're a small town bank, and as we've grown, they've also grown with us. They've got the resources that you would need in order to go big, but they also have that friendly local community feel so that it makes it seem easier than it probably is. Hello, welcome to Candidates Up Front. This series of interviews with candidates on the November 3rd general election ballot is brought to you by Berks Community Television and the League of Women Voters of Berks County. Both organizations are nonpartisan. That means we never support candidates nor political parties. But both organizations consider it their mission to provide voters with information about each election. I'm Judith Cranus, a member of the League. First, if you're not yet registered to vote, go to votespa.com to register. Votespa.com is in English and Spanish, and while you have until October 19th to register, the smart thing is, do it now. And if you do not want to stand in line on Election Day, apply for a mail-in ballot. Again, go to votespa.com and do it now. And if you give votespa.com your email address, they will send you emails with it on your ballot every step of the way so you always know what's happening. When your ballot arrives, get the information you need on the candidates. Watching programs like this or going online, make your decision and then mail your ballot back right away. We help our Berks County Election Services Office handle this election smoothly if we are timely. Now, if you choose to go to your polling place on Election Day, polls are open from 7 in the morning till 8 at night. This year, we will vote for Pennsylvania Attorney General, Auditor General, and Treasurer. We will also elect representatives to the U.S. Congress, to the Pennsylvania House, and to the Pennsylvania Senate. The League and BCTV invited all but the statewide candidates to be interviewed. Some did not reply, some declined. Those who agreed will be asked the same questions in the same order with the same time limits as others running for the same office. These interviews will be available on BCTV's webpage and YouTube channel. And if you watch the interviews of two competing candidates, you can compare their answers to make your decision on how you will vote. This interview is for United States Representative in Congress in the 6th District, and we do have a map. This district is the southern part of Berks County. Now, Congress is the legislative branch of our national government. It has two houses, the Senate and the House of Representatives. Representatives serve a two-year term. They propose and pass federal laws. The number of voting representatives in the House is fixed by law at no more than 435, proportionally representing the population of the, 15, of the 50 states and Pennsylvania currently has 18 representatives. The salary for a U.S. representative is $174,000 plus benefits and expenses. The two candidates for the 6th District are Chrissy Houlihan, the Democrat, and John Emmons, the Republican. This interview is with Chrissy Houlihan. She is the incumbent. Welcome, Mrs. Houlihan. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, our first question is, why do you want to serve in Congress and what are your qualifications for this position? Sure, and again, thank you for having me. Uh, by way of background, before joining Congress, I was an entrepreneur, I'm an engineer, I served in the uh, military and the Air Force as an engineer and I'm a veteran. I also am a former educator, so when I sort of looked around at the different backgrounds that I had, I believed that I had a lot of the pillars that were essential to be a good representative of our, of our community, whether it's because I've served in the military, served in growing good businesses in our, in our community, or also served as an educator uh, and thinking about our next generation 
generation. I think those are all the things that we should require our representatives to be thoughtful about. I do serve in Congress right now as a freshman, and so I'm hopeful that that has also earned uh, me the opportunity to gain experience in serving you in further uh, sessions. What are the three most important things that you want to accomplish? Sure, and perhaps maybe I'll go back to talk, to talk about what I believe I already have accomplished. First of all, in my first year and a half, I've already restored, restored and returned $3.5 million to our community. Uh, the community costs, uh, I cost the community about $1.3 million a year, so $2.6 million total. And with still about six months left in my term, I already have restored, as I mentioned, $3.5 million. So that's one big accomplishment I'm very proud of. Also very proud of our office's COVID response, where we've reorganized very much to pivot around small businesses and the individual. Uh, I will talk in my closing summary about what I hope to do uh, as if I'm able to return in this position. The pandemic continues. Had our, has our federal government responded appropriately, and should it do more? Please explain. Of course. I've been privileged enough to vote on four bipartisan packages already through the House of Representatives and on to the Senate and to the President's desk for signature. Uh, this response has been good, but not adequate, not enough. Uh, we have been responsive in trying to help our small businesses, to help those individuals who are particularly affected, to make sure that we're protecting our frontline workers. But I do not believe that we have made enough of a response as of yet. Uh, I have also voted forward an uh, act called the HEROES Act, and I look very much forward to the negotiating process with the Senate, Senate to make sure that we take that next step of pandemic relief. African Americans, Latinos, and other minorities have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19. What do you see as the explanation for this disparity, and what remedies would you propose? And you're absolutely right. I think uh, communities of color have been uh, demonstrably affected in a disproportionate way uh, with COVID. And that has been for a variety of different reasons. One is it, it tends to be that communities of color are those frontline workers more often than not. Uh, also, the, the health issues, health care issues of communities of color uh, have a significantly uh, less opportunity to access to health care and many more comorbidities comor or reasons why they may get more sick if they are exposed to COVID. So we have some short-term term issues that we need to take care of, which is uh, more aggressive uh, testing, t tracking, and t tracing of our communities, particularly those communities of color. But we also have long-term issues that we need to take care of, which is the uh, in inequalities and injustices of the lack of access to health care, uh, healthy food, healthy living, healthy environments for our communities of color as well. So this is a short-term issue that we need to think about, of course, with response to COVID, but also a much longer-term issue in terms of social justice and equity. Is our health system as a whole working well, or does it need change? And if you feel it needs change, would you advocate minor changes or major changes? Sure. And when I started running for Congress about three years ago for the first time, uh, I was definitely uh, aware that our number one, number two, and number three issue in this community, and I believe in the country, is health care, health care, and health care. Uh, I think that we really have a broken health care system. And in fact, over the last several years uh, under this current administration, fewer people are insured than were before. So we need to make sure that we're developing quality, affordable, and accessible health care for all people. Uh, and if we haven't understood that, until now, COVID has shown us why my health affects your health. Uh, and so we do need to make some changes to the healthcare system. I'm an advocate for having a, um, a public option that rides alongside our already existing private options that then can therefore compete with those private options and allows people to be able to have access and choice as well as affordability. I'm also in favor of prescription drug pricing being able to be negotiated by Medicare. Oh, that, you just answered the next question, which was a two-part question, uh, supporting, allowing Medicare to negotiate directly. And then what plan would you have for lowering prescription drug costs beyond that? Sure. That is also one of those uh, pain points in our community. In addition to health care, the access to affordable um, prescriptions and medications is something that I hear from a lot of, from people in our community, particularly things like insulin. Uh, and those kinds of things I've been able to vote several times on the, uh, in the last year and a half to try and reduce the prescription drug prices that people are experiencing and that, uh, that we are unfortunately under the pressure of. Unfortunately, none of those uh, bills has necessarily passed the Senate at this point in time. And so this is a pretty long-term, again, process that I'm hopeful in the next Congress we'll be able to take a look at. We need to be thinking about all the different aspects of the supply chain 
here. We need to be thinking about the insurers. We need to be thinking about the pharmaceutical companies. We need to be thinking about uh, the providers as well to try to find a way to work together to squeeze that balloon so that it's smaller rather than it pops in different areas. Uh, and I look forward very much in the next Congress to being able to be more helpful in reducing prescription drug prices. What should be done to prevent evictions and address homelessness during this pandemic? And that is an excellent question and something that I very much worry about. We have had a lot of people, uh, surprisingly, in Chester and Berks County that it seems to be a very affluent community, largely uh, really affected by this pandemic. And even before then, homelessness was def definitely an issue. Uh, in this pandemic, one of the things that we've done as a federal government and has also done been done at a state level as well is loan for forbearance or mortgage forbearance or forgiveness. Uh, I'm sorry, forbearance. We've also provided stimulus checks to folks, and that is so that people can hopefully, uh, in effect, shelter in place and not have to be displaced from their homes during such a critical time. And that's also why I very much would like to continue to support, through further stimulus and through further help through the HEROES Act, our communities, uh, to make sure that people under this very difficult situation are able as much as possible to stay in their jobs and stay in their homes. Do you favor any changes to Social Security, either the, ben the benefits or how we fund it? Please explain. Of course. Uh, Social Security is absolutely a bedrock of our uh, national contract with one another. Uh, we understand that we pay into it and we hope and expect that we will be able to benefit from it when we reach the age by which we can start to withdraw on that, on that investment. Uh, we do absolutely have issues uh, with solvency with this particular program, but it, it couldn't be more important that we protect it. So there are some elements that I, I am in support of. For instance, I'm in support of um, raising the threshold. Right now there's a cap on how much you're able to pay in if you earn above a certain income. I don't believe that we should maintain that cap. There also should be opportunities to, to do a holistic Social Security modification as well. This is a little bit like the, our immigration issue, which you can't just solve it with one particular solution, but rather you have to look at all of the different levers and opportunities to make sure we protect this really important resource, which is Social Security. I think we could have about 30 seconds more there. Could you explain that just a bit further? Of course. I think that Medicare. what's happening for people who earn above a certain income is that they are not required to pay proportionately the same amount as everybody else's. And so I believe that there shouldn't be a cap to that le that amount of money, but rather it should be that cap should be removed so that people are paying more, which would make Social Security more solvent. Thank you. Um, the Equal Pay for Equal Work law passed in 1963, yet there remains a wage gap between males and females and between minority and majority populations. Does more need to be done? Explain. I very much believe that more needs to be done. I believe uh, in equal pay for equal work. Uh, and it unfortunately, although there have been multiple attempts at laws passed, there also have been multiple attempts at uh, disrupting this really important tenet of what uh, ought to be, I think, understood by everyone. When women uh, work and they get paid the equal amount as men who work, the people who benefit are the families, and this is something that we really absolutely have to understand in order for us to be an equitable society and also for our families to be able to thrive. I did vote for this term and hope to vote for next term, the Paycheck Fairness Protection Act, to hopefully make sure that we continue to, to chip away at making sure that women and communities of color earn the same amount of money as men do. Thank you. What federal policies will you pursue to provide equity and opportunity for all Americans including the many groups that have been historically disadvantaged. Sure. And before joining Congress, right before joining Congress, I spent about five years uh, focusing on uh, communities of color, primarily children in communities of color, and primarily on the issue of early childhood literacy uh, and equity, uh, access to equitable education. And so some of the things that we really have failed ourselves and our communities of color on is not providing equitable access to education, uh, not providing equitable access to safe environments. Uh, air that we breathe is, is different depending on what communities you live in, and, and your water access is different on, depending on what communities that 
that you live in. And so I've been helpful in passing legislation that thinks about those kinds of things. But one thing that I learned from my time in the classroom uh, that really struck me was that I taught in a community that was 98, 99% black, and I, of course, was white. Uh, and not seeing a teacher that necessarily looked like you really, I think, has an impact. I still remember that I've only ever had one uh, woman engineering professor in my years of schooling. Uh, and so I think it's important that kids see people who look like them. So I've put forward legislation to be able to help more people of color to be able to be educators and to afford that educational opportunity to serve in that way. How can we avoid tariff wars and open new markets for American businesses and farmers? I think that this is, a, again, one of those very, very complicated questions uh, and an important one. I think w the way that we can avoid tariff wars and, uh, and the anxiety that I think that we felt over the last several years is not to piecemeal our approach. Uh, when we when we levy aluminum or steel taxes uh, against some of our trading partners without a more holistic approach to trade and tariff, we end up with uh, unintended consequences and some, frankly, intended consequences. Here in our community in Berks and in Chester County, we have a very large agricultural community, and some of those one-off taxes and tariffs ended up uh, consequentially hurting our agriculture industry. So I'd like to see in a future administration and also in a future Congress that we're much, much more thoughtful and deliberative about the way that we approach trade and tariffs. What is your plan to upgrade and maintain infrastructure, and how would you fund it? Sure. Uh, and I also have been uh, able to successfully vote in the House side and not yet in the, into the Senate on a very large infrastructure act. It's called the Moving Forward Act. Uh, this is a, a, a bill that talks about this real need that we have. When we come out of COVID, we're going to really need to build back our communities in a, in a much better way. Uh, Pennsylvania suffers from infrastructure issues like uh, most of the Northeast and like much of the country, and we very much need to address infrastructure uh, in terms of our ability to uh, restore our communities and our economy. I believe that we can do that in a combination of public and private um, partnership, and that infrastructure bill has that, that, that processing in it. The U.S. Voting Rights Act of 1965 allowed the Justice Department to review proposed state laws to assure no citizen would be deprived of their vote. Significant portions have been dismantled, or they expired and were not reinstated. Would you reinstate the 1965 Voting Rights Act? Explain. This is a critical question. I think that there are a couple things that are um, threatening our democracy in the republic right now, uh, and none more than the Voting Rights Act as well as gerrymandering and districts being kind of uh, determined by the people who are your representatives rather than uh, in a more fair way. And so I have voted uh, for the Voting Rights Act to be reinstated, and I will again. Uh, I also have voted for something called H.R. 1, which was the very first bill that I voted for as a freshman which very much talks about not just voting rights and access to the ballot, but also uh, ethics in government, uh, how we're going to reform campaign finance, and how we're going to make sure that we hold our, our elected officials to the highest standards of ethics. Uh, I hope that in the next Congress I will be able to have the opportunity to once again vote for a version of H.R. 1, and I hope very much that we'll be able to reinstate the 1965 Voting Rights Act as well. Videos of police brutality have brought racism to the forefront of discussions. What role can federal law play to end police brutality and racism? So the images that we have seen uh, over the last several months, particularly, but honestly over generations and in some cases centuries, are, are horrifying. And we have to believe and understand that race is an enormous issue in our country that we need to address head on uh, and, and systemic racism as well. I have been, uh, was privileged to vote for something called the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, uh, which was bipartisanly passed through the House. I am very, very hopeful that the Senate will take up something similar, because I very much believe there is a federal role that can be played here. Uh, and that particular act talks a little bit about making sure that any federal funding that goes to our, our state uh, policing or local policing has effectively some strength attached to it, uh, which mandates that people have um, kind of best practices and been trained in um, making sure that we're com keeping our communities safe as, po as police uh, should do. 
In your opinion, what are the causes of gun violence in our country, and what is the role of federal legislation? One of the most important things to know about Chester and Berks County is that about 40% of us own guns. In fact, I actually just heard that in uh, June alone, we sold another 100,000 guns in our community. Uh, that being said, even though we're gun owners, uh, we definitely believe, the majority of us believe, more than 70% of us on some questions and 90% on other questions, that there are things that we can be doing to make our communities safer. Uh, and we really are looking for our federal government to help us make our communities and our schools particularly safer. Uh, I have been instrumental in the first uh, term of my Congress in voting for several bills that talk about gun safety and making sure that our communities are more safe. Uh, background checks are one of those things, and that is one thing that is part of the roles of, role of gun violence in our community. Uh, and we very much need to pass these bills that talk about something as simple as background checks. The United States pulled out of the World Environmental Alliance, the Kyoto Accords. Should we be back in it? Climate change uh, is something that I think I just saw a statistic, 99.99% of scientists believe that climate change is real and that human beings are causing it. And we all know, or at least uh, I believe we all know, what an important role the United States plays on the global stage in addressing this issue and what a participant we are in, in contributing to this issue. I am saddened that uh, over the last several years we have uh, taken a backseat on the world stage in the form of the Kyoto Accords as well as the Paris Climate uh, Accord. I have voted to make sure that we go back into the Paris Climate Accord, uh, and I'm hopeful that in the next Congress that we will address uh, the fact that that uh, climate uh, safety and, and climate change are actually also a national security issue uh, and that we need to be thinking not just about our immediate health and restoring our planet, but also what the impacts are in terms of our future health. Agriculture counts for about half of Berks County's economy. Our local farmers are adapting as much as possible to changes in the climate. Should the federal government be addressing climate change to protect agriculture? So I've had the privilege in the last year and a half uh, to travel all over Berks and Chester County and I'm particularly focused on the agriculture industry. We have the nation's mushroom capital of the world here. We have specialty crops here. Uh, we, of course, have a lot of dairy here and our, our agriculture and farmers are really under pretty acute pressure right now. Uh, one part of that pressure is about adapting to climate change and I, I do believe that the federal government has a role in making sure that we are helpful in designing regulations and protections uh, for our planet and also for our businesses. But I also think the federal government has an important role in other things. As an example, I joined G.T. Thompson, who's one of our Republican colleagues here in Pennsylvania, in legislation and funding for our spotted lanternfly issue, which, as you probably know, particularly this time of year, is a very, very big issue that's really threatening a lot of our vineyards and other uh, specialty crops as well. So this is something that the federal government can have a role in as well. What steps, if any, should our, should our nation take to reform current immigration policies? So another thing that I've learned here in my year and a half uh, in office is that we, uh, prior to the pandemic, had a real uh, workforce shortage problem. We had a lot of jobs. We had a lot of people, but the jobs and the people didn't necessarily match up. I travel to, uh, in Chester County, we have QVC headquarters there. They were desperately looking people for people with high-skilled jobs. Also in Chester and Berks County, where the mushroom farmers are, they were desperately looking for people to be able to fill the jobs as mushroom pickers or growers. Uh, so we have this supply problem and demand problem. So immigration policy is, is very, very complicated, but I don't believe that the United States is full. Uh, I do believe that we need to create robust and thoughtful immigration reform that welcomes people like the five-year-old uh, child that my dad was when he came here as an immigrant and refugee uh, from Poland, and also welcomes high, highly skilled workers as well. I think we have the opportunity to create a holistic immigration reform policy together, and I'm hopeful to do that in the next Congress. People rely on the U.S. Postal Service. Do you think it should function on a strictly business model? or as a public service? Explain. Sure. Uh, our postage uh, service is definitely under siege, and I think that I have never seen the amount of calls as I've seen when the postage uh, service 
came under fire. Uh, people were very, very concerned about their access to their mail. Uh, a lot of folks get their prescription drugs through the mail. Uh, people obviously need to vote through the mail, particularly during a pandemic. And a lot of rural uh, places in our communities don't have access to, uh, to other forms like UPS or FedEx uh, delivery or DHL delivery. And so I do believe that the U.S. Postal Service should be something that is an asset for all of us uh, in this nation. And I do believe that they should be able to deliver regularly to all of us. I have, uh, through my vote several times now, restored funding or attempted to restore funding to the post office to make sure that it is solvent. We have increased our deficit due to the pandemic. How do you suggest we dig ourselves out of this hole? So I'm a business person, uh, first and foremost. I believe in a fiscally responsible uh, government. I believe in fiscally responsible households. Um, I am a freshman representative, an elected freshman representative of the very largest caucus in Congress, uh, uh, ideological caucus in Congress called the New Dems. We are 105 members strong, and we caucus on the issue of pro-business, pro-opportunity, pro-capitalism, uh, but we also do that with an eye towards fiscal responsibility. Responsibility. Now is not the time for us to be uh, penny wise and pound foolish. We very much need to make sure that we are addressing this pandemic head on. Uh, but then when uh, hopefully we have normal times, we definitely need to be more responsive to making sure that we're as responsible as possible to your taxpayer dollars as well. That being said, I believe that our budget is a reflection of our values, and I believe that we have uh, not necessarily had this, the values of the American people in mind when we've been putting budgets together. Thank you. We do have 60 seconds left. You may make a closing comment. First of all, thank you very much for having me here and for the opportunity to, to say hello in a very strange time, uh, not in person but virtually. Uh, thank you very much for the honor and the privilege that you've provided by allowing me to serve and represent us for the last uh, term in Congress. I am very, very excited to hopefully continue to serve and would ask very much for your continued support and your vote. When I started running for Congress, uh, it was under the, the motto that there is work to be done. Uh, and I very much believe that there is still so much work to be done. And in fact, I would argue maybe now there is more work to be done than ever. So again, I'm so grateful to you for your support. I'm so grateful to the people of Chester and Berks County. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward to hopefully continuing to serve us in the future. Thank you, Mrs. Houlihan. You're welcome. And thank you for watching Candidates Upfront. We make about 45 million pounds of chips in a quarter. That equates to about 200 million pounds of potatoes, which is quite a few. What's interesting with M&T is, is they're a small town bank, and as we've grown, they've also grown with us. They've got the resources that you would need in order to go big, but they also have that friendly local community feel so that it makes it seem easier than it probably is.